This is the third Sunday of Advent. You already figured that out with the lighting of the third candle in the Advent wreath. Uh, next Sunday, of course, the fourth Sunday of Advent. Advent is those four weeks prior to Christmas when we prepare ourselves in a way that we don't do normally the rest of the year, although probably we ought to, um, to receive the gracious good news and also the life-transforming power of Jesus in our lives. Next Sunday, uh, the choir will be here at the 1010 service and be singing uh, a, a musical presentation called Bethlehem's Child. So you'll want to be here next Sunday. Uh, the music will be beautiful even as it was this morning, just a few moments ago. Uh, two Sundays ago, I started this series of messages on the songs of Christmas. And you'll remember on December 1, I talked about Zechariah's song, song. He was the father of John the Baptist. And he had a vision from the angel when he was serving in the temple in Jerusalem, told him that he would see the Messiah come and that his son would be a prophet of the Most High of the Messiah. And then the second Sunday, that was a week ago, I started on the angel's song. Glory to God in the highest on peace on earth and goodwill to men. And I focused on that. This Sunday, it's about Mary's song which uh, we just heard so ably sung about. It's, it's a song about uh, God's exaltation of the humble. And next week, of course, will be Bethlehem's Child with the choir here. And then on Christmas Eve, that's going to be right after next Sunday, we're going to be here, and I'm going to, at, at 7 at nine, and 9 o'clock, I'm going to talk about the angel song part 2, another part of the angel song that we, uh, we don't always notice, but it's really important and integral to all this whole thing called Christmas. And then on December 29th, we're going to all be here at, what time are we going to be here? Is it going to be 10 o'clock or 10.10? You know what? Everybody aim for 10 o'clock, okay? <laughs> and you'll be here on time. We're going to have just one combined service on December 29th. So be here at 10 o'clock. And then I'm going to talk about Simeon's song. And if you don't know who Simeon is, I direct you to Luke chapter 2. Look it up and read it. So today, let's, let's take a look at Mary's song. As I said, it's a song about God's exaltation of the humble. It's really a revolutionary song, and I hope you'll see what I mean when we get into it. Malachi the prophet said, I, the Lord, do not change. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change. And yet, if we look at our world around us, change is all we see. In fact, in the last 50 years, the world has seen revolutionary changes. We had, first of all, in the 60s, the Cultural Revolution. Anybody remember that? Anybody here old enough to remember that? I kind of do. Kind of do that. Remember that? You know that there was a Cultural Revolution going on in China at the same time? Theirs was a little different and way more dramatic. Well, I don't know, different. So we had the Cultural Revolution in the 60s, and it, that included a sexual revolution, which is still ongoing, followed in the 90s by the Technological Revolution, and that's still ongoing as well. In the midst of that, there was political revolution going on as well, and it finally came to fruition or to a head in 1989. Anybody remember being alive in 1989? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The former Soviet Union. When I was a kid, uh, back in the 1860s, <laughs> now when I was a child in the 60s and 70s, the Soviet Union, the communist bloc, seemed like it would stand forever, unassailable. And in 1989, it crumbled. And the communist leaders... The strong, powerful communist leaders of all those countries are gone, a distant memory. Communism has gone everywhere except, well, Cuba and North Korea and Berkeley, California. Um, <laughs> and in the Middle East, and in the Middle East, there's still political and social, social upheaval going on. This past week, you may remember that Nelson Mandela passed away and he has been mourned worldwide, former president of South Africa. He spent 27 years in prison. That's what really separated from all the other world dignitaries that were there. He spent 27 years in prison and came out a changed man. Not bitter, 
but better. And because of him, South Africa was able to peacefully transition from an apartheid to an inclusive government. That was a revolutionary change in our times. And yet, during these times, even up to today, there are dark clouds on the horizon. In the 1990s, the age of Aquarius gave way to the age of AIDS, sobering some to the price of the sexual revolution. Traditional marriage has been breaking down for decades with the attendant problems for children in all of society. The technological revolution is, is changing the way we communicate and shop and start a business. Technology has brought great personal conveniences and distractions, but also great risks. Who today does not think about identity theft? And recent revelations of government spying, you know, the NSA tracking our cell phones, how do you like that? It's got a lot of people apprehensive. Can we ever regain lost privacy and liberty? So as the world revolves, it's as though we've been given box seats to watch the moral, cultural, cultural and technological revolutions that are going on all around us. And what kind of future are we moving toward? Yet there is one revolution that answers the uncertainty and apprehensions of our day and brings clarity to the moral and spiritual confusion around us. The greatest revolution of all time began in a stable long ago in the quiet village of Bethlehem in a small country called Israel. Now, I know that sounds glib, maybe even trite for many people, but stick with me. Hang in there with me this morning, and I think you'll begin to see why I can say the greatest revolution of all time happened in a stable back then. Many of you already know the story of how Joseph and pregnant Mary traveled there to Bethlehem because of a, a government census, a government decree. And because so many other travelers were there also, there was no room for them at the inn. And Mary and Joseph spent that night in a stable. And there Mary gave birth to Jesus. Thus Jesus came into the world, born in a forgotten village, laid in a feeding trough, unnoticed by the sleeping world, and you know, you just wouldn't expect a revolution to begin in a place like that. If you were planning an important, world impact, significant entrance, that's probably not the way you do it, but that's the way it happened. The greatest revolution in history started in a stable. And Christmas is about the birth of the greatest revolutionary of all time, Jesus Christ. Now, it really all began nine months earlier than that, when an angel of the Lord visited Mary with the news that she'd been chosen by God to give birth to the Messiah. And the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 1, how Mary went to visit her relative Elizabeth, who was herself pregnant with John the Baptist. You remember that story? I told that one two weeks ago. That was the occasion when Mary went to visit Elizabeth. That was the occasion for Zechariah's song about the coming Savior. When Elizabeth saw Mary, she greeted her with these famous words. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. When Mary heard these confirming words, she broke out into song. You know, I think this ought to be the Christmas musical. We got all these songs, you know, and they break out in song on these wonderful occasions. We read those in Luke chapter 1. Christy read those words for us. This song has traditionally been called the Magnificat. That comes from the first word of the Latin version, which is magnify. What does magnify mean? To make bigger, right? To make bigger, to make larger. 
Mary was magnifying, her soul magnifying God, making more room for God in her soul and her life. When we magnify God, we're letting God have a bigger place in our lives. So for 2,000 years, this song has been sung by Christians all over the world, and it's really part of Christian worship. Now, like most songs, the Magnificat can easily be divided into stanzas. Stanza one and stanza two. Stanza one is verses 46 to 50, and stanza two consists of verses 51 to 55. You didn't know you were coming to music class this morning, did you? Now here we go. We're going to look at stanza number one first. You know, we could call this stanza, If God Had Wanted Wealth. In stanza one, Mary is looking inward at her own situation and sings of what it means to be God's chosen one to bear the Messiah. You know, I just had a thought. I'm talking about the words, but where's, where are the notes? Where's the melody? I think that's a good assignment for Andrew to find the original score for this song. <laughs> You Google it, did you? Okay. Oh, good. You got it on your phone. Good, good. That's great. Mary's singing about what it means to be God's chosen one to bear the Messiah. She praises God. My soul glorifies the Lord for his great mercy to her personally. That's what she's singing about, what God has done for her personally. Choosing her despite her lowly estate, as she says, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Circle that word humble. Circle that word. Because it refers to Mary's age and her background, her economic condition, and her lack of social standing. You've got to remember, Mary came from Galilee, the northern part of Israel. That's upcountry, man. It's not where the center of the worship life, the political life, and the economic life of the country is, of God's people. It's upcountry there where they speak with a weird accent. You know, one of those kind of accents we might find in a place like Arkansas? <laughs> Something like that. So it's like Mary's, Mary's asking, why me, O oh Lord, when you could have had one of those well-connected girls from Jerusalem? Well, here's the thing. If God had wanted wealth for his son, he could have arranged it. If God had wanted Jesus to be born in the lap of luxury, he had only to say the word. If God had wanted Jesus to have elite schooling or the proper social connections or any other things that men usually consider necessary for success, it would have been done. The wonder of Christmas is that Mary was chosen not because of anything she did or anything she had. Mary, you see, was not the last choice after everyone else said no. She wasn't even God's first choice. Mary was God's only choice. And that's God's sheer grace. Now think about that. That same grace of God is extended to you, everyone here this morning, not because anything you've done or anything you have, but because God is just like that. No wonder, Mary says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. So after 2,000 years, we're still talking about Mary. And outside of Elizabeth... Can you name even one other mother who lived in Israel in Mary's day? Mary is remembered forever. So that's stanza number one, what God has done for someone of low estate. Stanza number two, I think we could call this one, he turned the world upside down. Now Mary's point of view was focused on herself and what God has done for her personally. Now her focus is outward. And she praises God for the effects of Christ that Christ will have on the world. Now, did you notice something here? The verb tenses in verses 51 through 55. Did you notice that the verb tenses changed? You know, anytime in the Bible when there's a, a verb tense change, you've got to take notice. 
When Mary sings about herself in the first stanza, she uses the present tense. But when she sings about Jesus, she uses the past tense. He has performed. He has scattered. He has brought down. He has filled. Underline all of those past tense verbs there. What the heck is going on? At this point, the Lord Jesus is still growing inside of Mary's body. So how can she speak in the past about what Christ will do in the future? Do you ever talk like that? Well, you know, the Old Testament prophets sometimes would use the past tense to describe what they saw as an absolutely certain future event. Mary is so utterly convinced about what her son, the Lord Jesus, will do when he comes that she speaks of it as if it had already happened. It is an accomplished fact because God has willed it to happen. And you know that God sends his word forth and his word never comes back unfulfilled. So, in verses 51 to 53, Mary describes what has happened because she knows it will happen. Three revolutionary changes that will happen on earth because of the birth of Jesus Christ. Let's look at them, one, two, three. Number one, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. Christ's birth brings about a moral revolution. The coming of Christ means the end of all human boasting, insatiable greed, and unbridled ambition. Think of the Tower of Babel, that story from the book of Genesis. The proud gather together in their grandiose schemes to build a tower to heaven. And in their temporary success, they congratulate themselves. But suddenly, the proud are scattered by God to the four winds. Across the centuries, all who have challenged the Almighty, all who have sought to bring heaven down to earth, have been brought low by the strong arm of the Lord. Where is Saddam Hussein? Whatever happened to Eric Honecker? Does anybody know? Whatever happened to him? Do you know who he was? No. What about Idi Amin? Where is he these days? What about Vladimir Ilyich Lenin? When was the last time that you thought about Juan Perón? Huh? Or how about Ho Chi Minh? You think about him pretty regularly? You know, in southern China, there is a massive railway station with large statues, columns, and a museum all dedicated to Mao Zedong. And there's a main railway line that runs straight to it and dead ends at that spot. And it stands empty today. Even the Chinese people don't want to go there and visit it. I predict the very same thing is going to happen with Fidel Castro and all the other strong men around the world. They come, they rise to power, and sooner or later, they disappear. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the arm of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. So that's the first Revolutionary change. Second, that Mary sings about, he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. His birth brings about a social revolution. Too often, those who hold power swell with pride. Who was it? British parliamentarian um, Edmund Burke said, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts corrupts absolutely. Those who have power too often forget that all that they have really comes from God. 
John Calvin said it back in the 1600s when he was reading a ref leading a reform in Switzerland. He said, if the Lord cannot tolerate such ingratitude, we should not be surprised. If we lived forever, we would all soon forget God. But the Bible reminds us, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Third thing, third revolution. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich empty away. The birth of Christ brings an economic revolution. Now, this is the most revolutionary part of Mary's song. In Jesus Christ, there is no such thing as a common man or a common woman or the masses. God provides for the needs of all and each and every one. Not through a government program, which really only concentrates power and wealth in a still sinful group of people. God provides for all through people, not looking down their nose, but seeing potential for each and every one. And that's why the poor are usually the first to believe the gospel. They don't have anyone else to trust. But the rich don't see their need for Christ because oh, they can buy their own gods. You know, that's a line that was told me on the phone by a, a, another pastor in Palo Alto when I lived up there, telling me, you know, these people here don't need to go to church. They can buy their own God. The gospel makes better people, and better people make a better world. The result of Christ's moral, social, and economic revolution is better people making a better world. Whenever the gospel has entered a society and made an impact on a significant group of people, it has always had the effect of lifting those people up economically. That's what happened in England with the Wesleyan movement at Wesley's headquarters in London. It was called the Foundry, by the way. They had bought a, a used factory. It was a foundry because that's where they used to make cannons and cannonballs. And in there, the Wesley brothers installed their ministry. They had a chapel for worship. And also job skills and stewardship practices were taught along with Bible and Christian doctrine. So how does this all happen? This economic transformation, social and moral transformation. Well, all we have to do is look at some of the stories in our own backyard. The mission at Kern. We heard last week, uh, my wife and, there, and I were there for, for an event. Um, Herb Taylor, you were there too. We heard the testimonies of Catherine and Allison. Playing the guitar was Tyler, and I've heard his testimony as well. They all abused alcohol and drugs for years. They abandoned or abused their families and friends. They lived on public assistance and handouts for years. But when they came to Christ, they got saved from those addictions and got a new, a new purpose in life. And that new purpose gave them a new desire. And out of that new desire, they got their lives together, got a job, found a home, and became productive citizens. Their story is repeated a hundredfold, a thousandfold around the globe with those who are down and out and who find new life in Christ. So it is that the gospel makes better people, and better people make a better world. The gospel not only works an in inner transformation, that's where it begins, it also works an outward transformation that literally changes the way people think and talk and act, and in the process, it produces the qualities that tend toward economic progress. You get it? You know, it's not something you could easily put in a 30-second soundbite or a bumper sticker and run a political campaign on. It's easier to make vague promises. But the real deal is in Jesus Christ, who transforms lives. The gospel is the only hope for humanity, for the soul and for the body, for the church and for the world, for the individual and for society. When the gospel makes headway in a society, there you will find more peace and more tranquility and ultimately more prosperity. I didn't say you would find heaven on earth because we await that with our Lord's return. But you will find more of what the Lord intends. 
peace and tranquility and prosperity. Well, besides being the very first Christmas carol, the Magnificat is something else. Dr. E. Stanley Jones, the great Methodist scholar, author, and evangelist and missionary in India, said that the Magnificat was the most revolutionary document in the history of the world. Now, that's quite a statement to make, don't you think? But consider this. Years before Dr. Jones made that statement, William Temple, the Archbishop of Canterbury, instructed his missionaries to India never to read the Magnificat in public when unbelievers were present. Why? Because in a country like India, with all of its poverty and rigid caste system, this portion of scripture, if taken out of context and understanding, would cause nothing but trouble, and especially for the Christian converts. Here's the reason. Mary's song teaches us that God doesn't suffer gladly the proud. He doesn't run with the rulers of the world. He doesn't come to the people who think that they've got it made. You see, God's at home with the humble and the tired and the weak and the hurting, the handicapped, the deaf, the blind, the lame, the feeble, and the lowly of this world. God comes to those who revere his name. So what a song we've got here, the Magnificat. Bible scholar William Barclay calls, calls it, uh, well, he says, there is loveliness in the Magnificat, but in that loveliness there is dynamite. Christianity begets a revolution in each person and revolution in the world. We might call this song Lovely Dynamite. But here's the thing. God remembers. Each of those two stanzas of Mary's song conclude with a reference to God's mercy. Maybe like the refrain of a song. His mercy extends to those who fear him. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. That's a nice way to put it, isn't it? God remembered to be merciful. Do you sometimes forget to be merciful? Aren't you glad God remembers to be merciful? Aren't you glad that God remembered to send his son? Where would we be if Jesus had not come? There'd be a lot less hope and light in the world. What God began in Bethlehem is far greater than the English Revolution, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, or the Russian Revolution. What God started in Bethlehem was a spiritual and moral and economic revolution whose effects are still being felt today. And nothing in all history can match what God did when he sent his son to the earth. Do you know what Christmas is really all about? Christmas is really the anniversary of the revolution. It's the 1776 for the whole human race. When you set up a manger scene on a table at home, or like this one up here, you're setting up a revolutionary symbol. Every time we sing a Christmas carol, we're singing a revolutionary anthem. And every time you send out a Christmas card, if it makes any reference to Jesus at all, you are sending out revolutionary literature. And you know what the great oddity in all of this is that the secularists and the atheists who want to ban references to Christmas and Jesus from the public schools and the public squares understand the meaning of Christmas better than we do. Why do you think it's banned in North Korea? Because Jesus overturns the tables of those strong rulers. 
outside of these doors at Christmas time, the battle is raging. Jesus started a war against Satan and his kingdom and a war that goes on all around us day and night, a war in which men and women are the spoils of battle. When you celebrate Christmas, you are turning the secular values of this world upside down, just like Mary sang in the Magnificat, just like it tells us in the Psalms, like this, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's what the Savior has come for, to make his enemies a footstool. Now think of all the great leaders you can. Name all the great leaders you can think of. Which of them would you mention in the same breath with Jesus? Would you consider them a living presence or enter eternity with their names on your lips? Jesus Christ is the one who addresses us and is addressed by us and in whose name we pray. And since he came into the world, things have never been the same. His revolution continues. God remembers. So Jesus Christ, our revolutionary commander, seeks those who will rally to his cause, take up his banner, and bring others to him. He holds the future. So today and every day, his call is the same. Come and join the revolution, and let's change the world together. Will you say with me these words from Mary's song, Luke 1:47? My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Luke 1, 47. Amen.